Hey everyone, it's Susan with Shark Exploitation Sunday, and we're back with a vengeance because boy, do I have a very special episode for you. Here is my interview with one of the most prolific filmmakers known to mankind. This guy is up to 96 movies, 96 projects that this guy has worked on. And if you're familiar with my book, Encyclopedia Shark Exploitanica, or you watch this channel, you've heard his name before. And he's brought you some shark exploitation gems like the one that just dropped. It's available on Tubi. It's called Cocaine Shark. And also one of my favorites, Sharkenstein. He's brought you Shark Enc Encounters of the Third Kind. He's brought you Jurassic Shark 2, Aquapocalypse. And another brand new one that's on Tubi, Jurassic Shark 3, Sea Venge. The list goes on and on. I, I, tickled pink to present my interview with one of my faves. I'm a huge fan, director, filmmaker, and all around really super nice guy, Mark Polonia. So let's get to it. What's um, on your shirt? Is that a Godzilla uh, shirt? Well, yes, it yes. is. <laughs> and that was going to a little segue um, into, I, I heard telling that you were inspired to become a filmmaker because of a Godzilla movie. Yes, when I was five, it was it was raining outside. My brother and I couldn't go outside and play. So we turned on the TV. You had three channels back in 1973. I mean, and uh, Godzilla was on, Godzilla versus The Thing, which is Godzilla versus Mothra, but that's what it was called on TV. And I remember watching it and at, at first being terrified, but then you know, just absolutely fascinated with what I was seeing. How was this done? How this giant thing come out of the dirt? Why is it stepping on people and blowing up? You know, the whole thing just intrigued me and something clicked. And I remember thinking to myself, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do, you know, because you're around grownups that work and you know, someday you're going to have to get a job. And um, that was it. From there, uh, you know, no internet in 1973. You had to go to the library and find books about filmmaking because we understood enough that it was a film. I mean, we, my brother and I, and we would take out books and read them and write stuff down. And, and we got a book on script writing. And our first script was called, it was three pages long. It was called The Return of Count Dracula. I could recite it from front to back, but, um, so we would do that. We would write, and then we got a hold of it. Our can we bought a camera, Super 8 camera, and started making, you know, little movies, awful ones at first because we didn't understand narrative or framing or, you know, shut the camera off, don't film someone walk all the way up a road and go into a door, you know, that kind of stuff you learn later. But, you know, it was it's a progressive thing. Then we would shoot movies with sound, uh, sync sound, which was awful on a super eight camera so we had to learn how to redub stuff fully redub then we would you know let's you know they shoot movies outside at night let's figure out how to do this so we would light stuff and do special effects and you know we'd be blowing up fake heads in our backyard at two in the morning and it was just a crazy time but it was an experimental time where you learn and then video sort of came into the picture and we we adopted that because it was much cheaper the problem was is you really had to relearn a lot of what you knew but you know we shot a movie called church of the damned which we never finished that was in high school we shot another one called hallucinations which finally got released many years later and then the summer we graduated from high school we were only 17 we shot Splatter Farm and that movie got released all over the United States. So that was in like 1987, 87. Yep. So it was, it was a progressive, um, it was a progressive kind of learning because I never went to film school. I always, it was self-taught and, or I've always had a job most of my life in, in the uh, video film production profession. So I was fortunate there that what I didn't learn on set, you learn working for someone else. So um, it's really, I tell people I don't want to make movies. I have to make movies. 
because I'm that passionate about it. I love to create things. And, and even after all these years, I mean, 1987 was a long time ago. You know, I've met a lot of filmmakers that came and went because that, that, that passion got beat out of them, you know, because they got screwed by distributors or the, you know, the, the film they were working on, people walked off this, you know, there's a million horror stories about making films, but, you know, and that's happened to us in, in some regard, but it, you never, you never lose the love for it or the passion for it. And you, you know, when you've been through that kind of trial by fire, you know, you picked the right profession. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm a writer and I, uh, yeah, it's, you have to love what you're doing. And especially with my, you know, specific, I write extreme horror. I write horror poetry, but I also have my encyclopedia sharks Titanica book where I, it's a tongue in cheek comedic love letter to shark cinema. And you're, you're in it. You're all of course. <laughs> okay, you make, you make, so this is why I spe I'm specifically going to talk to you about shark movies because that's kind of my jam. Okay. Um, but it is a very niche thing to do, you know, and uh, you, the kind of movies you make, I'm sure has a pretty niche audience. And uh, I mean, you don't get the best reviews and um, I'm familiar with that as well, <laughs> being a writer. <laughs> Right, but it's right. Just, you know, I just think that people just don't get it. Well, you know, and, and you got to you have to understand, as, as you probably do, you know, someone who rented the Meg and then rents Sharkenstein is clearly going to be gobsmacked with why is this what's this movie doesn't look anything like that, because most people, I think they're becoming more aware of it, but they really aren't aware acutely of the grassroots filmmaking movement and micro budget movies and and I can understand why there's a level of criticism um but on the same hand you you get all these people who probably tried what you tried and failed miserably so anyone that does succeed even by the smallest amount is going to get leveled you know a, a heap of criticism for whatever reason but you can't I don't read reviews. I just, I honestly don't. Um, and I know there's a lot of negative stuff out there about what we do, but there's also a lot of positive stuff out there about what we do. So, right. it, you know, it all balances itself out. And honestly, I make films because I want to. And I think there is some success and cult status in what we've done. And, and not that you're looking for that, because I don't. That's something someone else pins on you. But you know, you, you got to do what's in your heart and you got to do what you love and the hell with what people think. Because I, relate, I mean, I relate to that completely because like it's same, you know, like a lot of people don't like what I'm writing about. I write, you know, violent feminist kind of stuff. And, and you know, that doesn't always agree with everybody. But I, yeah, I mean, I do it because I love it and it's going to find its audience, whoever that's meant to be. But right. it's funny you brought up Sharkenstein. Because I was kind of in that little bit, like, not sure what to think of your movies until I saw <laughs> Darkenstein and it completely changed. That's the movie where I went, I get it now. Oh, I get it now. And it was, it's so charming. And people who watch this channel and, you know, my book, I wax poetic about how much I love Sharkenstein. It's one of my faves. And one thing that I love about it, and you do this in a lot of your movies, and I always call it claymation, but it's actually called stop motion. Stop motion. Okay. I love that you do that because nobody does that anymore. Mm -hmm. And when I was a little kid, just like you, I watched Creature Double Feature on Saturday afternoon. And I watched Clash of the Titans and Harryhausen's stop motion stuff. And it blew my mind. And I've been a huge fan of that. So you do that all the time. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you. I squeal with delight. And Sharkenstein is heavily, heavily featuring some of that stop motion. And we get two versions of Sharkenstein. Spoiler alert. But if you haven't watched Sharkenstein people out there, fix that now. But love it. I love it. So do you do that? Do, who exactly is doing that? Is it just a collective effort or? It is. You know, we, we, we try to put a lot of practical effects in our films. 
I'm not a super fan of totally digital movies. Like I'm not a fan of the Avengers, those superhero movies, even like the Star Wars stuff. It's just, it's too much. I mean, I like tangible things, especially when you're on a set shooting and nothing looks more real than models that are real. They may not be real dinosaurs, but it's a physical real model. It's not a bunch of pixels someone played with. And, and, you know, good for the digital CGI movement. I think it's advanced cinema, but I think it's abused. And personally, I, I just, we use it when we have to, but I would prefer, prefer practical effects and i'm a fan of stop motion i started working with that uh when i was about 10 or 11 with clay things and um sometimes i do the animation and build the model sometimes my son does and sometimes a guy named brett piper who's a filmmaker in his own right does some of the work but i always try to put a little bit of stop motion in everything that i do because it's such a fascinating art form i mean you could have a a 10-hour discussion just on that but it and and it's it's not died you know there's a point where you thought no this is no one's going to do this but there's probably more stop motion done today than there was 20 years ago um but i that's how i like to bring things to life it's and yeah of course it doesn't look real none of this is real they're movies they're not supposed to look real that's, I think, what makes it magical. It's not perfect. It's not per. Stop motion is not a perfect art form. CGI is because you can do everything and fix it and make it right. Well, I appreciate the heck out of you using stop motion. It, it pleases me to no end. And I was just lucky enough to watch this morning Cocaine Shark. <laughs> and that's out on Tubi right now. Um, which brings me another question I'll ask in a little bit, but, and again, lovely stop motion and the, they have, it's a, it's a crab shark. Well, it's called crab shark, Um, (laughs) which the delivery of that line is like, it's a monster that's a shark and a crab. We call it crab shark. And yeah, I got the humor in that. Um, So cocaine shark is pretty on trend with a certain other movie that came out recently. And I did notice also, you know, 2021's virus shark seemed to be pretty on trend with what was going on in the world. Um, so is that, is that something you like to do is kind of like capture the moment in time, what's going on in the- Most, <laughs> most of it's a happy accident. Um, virus shark was specifically made because of the COVID uh, outbreak, but cocaine shark was sort of in the right place at the right time. It was originally called Narco Shark, and it was made a year before anyone even heard the word cocaine bear. Um, it just it just happened to be in the right place at the right time, and a title change, you know, fixed all that. But so you already had it done, and then yeah, it's just oh yeah, yeah, it was it was finished seven or eight months before. It was finished a year before Cocaine Bear ever came out. Um, oh wow! So it was just one of those, you know. People often think, oh, people steal ideas, but it's not. It's two different people in two different places with similar ideas. Um, And it just happened to have a drug theme with a monster and a shark. So, you know, any producer is going to change the title, which, thank God, nothing, you know, happened because of that. (laughs) Well, that kind of is a question I had because I, I get to apologize to you in person because I have been very upset about the promotional poster for Amityville Island for a long time (laughs) because it is a complete bamboozle and I'm like well there is a giant shark on it and then there was this maybe two seconds of shark in the movie it was just about a a minute yeah yeah (laughs) I was so mad because I I blamed you but it wasn't you it was the distributor right I have I have no control over the artwork but and that's my ignorance of this whole industry so like anything I said about the bad poster (laughs) I take back no you're not the only one that did (laughs) when I first saw it I was a little taken back I'm like yeah okay it has a shark a boat a water and an island but maybe not quite in this concept but you know the distributor has a job to do too and and at least uh at least the poster the artwork doesn't totally fabricate the content of the movie it might put it in a 
different perspective. <laughs> well, they changed titles too, right? So Alien versus Sharks became Shark Encounters of the Third Kind. Correct. And that wasn't you either, was it? No, no, it was, yeah. I, the original title card said Aliens versus Sharks on it, yeah. But distributors, you know, you make a movie, the, the shelf life of a movie from the time you produce it and hand it over and, and you know, deliver all the elements is sometimes eight months to a year, sometimes longer. So, you know, the distributor has to look at what's trendy and, and okay, how can we rename this? And maybe, you know, Aliens versus Sharks, I think, it is sort of a bland title. I kind of like shark encounters better, but you know, they have the right to change that. And, and often, often they do a pretty good job. Um, I've never been seriously disappointed by any of the kind of, you know, changing or alterations that might happen once you deliver a movie, because when you, when you, when you make a movie for distribution company, it's theirs. You know, they, they paid for it. They can do what they want. You really don't have, you can't, you can put your foot down and say, I don't like that, but that's, that's as, about as much as you can do. But I've never felt that. Um, even in my career, we've made 96 films and, you know, they're all out there. The, the advertising has been pretty spot on. Yeah. Well, I, I know that I've seen a lot of all over my newsfeed, Cocaine Shark. And when Sharkula was about to come out, that was blowing up on social media. And I wonder, like, you know, we're older people and we remember when there wasn't cell phones and social media or even DVDs or <laughs> definitely right. not streaming platforms. Right. Um, how do you feel that like streaming, has that affected your movie making or, you know, has it? changed anything for you it hasn't affected it i mean the, the the process of making a movie has pretty much been unchanged for a hundred years and uh you know you get better equipment and whatnot but you know marketing a movie is a whole different thing it used to be you know back in the 70s and 80s you had to get a theatrical release you know a lot of stuff still wasn't coming to television um, home video is really where we got our foot in the door you know, that was a medium, again, that Hollywood failed to really acknowledge as anything other than, you know, oh, you know, these are all old crappy movies no one cares about until they saw people making millions of dollars off of it. Then it changed the game. They got into it and, and pretty much forced the independents out because, you know, they would tell stores, you know, you're stocking 80 copies of this movie. You don't have room for this. And so, you know, the independent filmmaker always has to sort of be looking at the next trend. And streaming is a little different because there's so much with the digital delivery and whatnot. It's, a, it, it's become a giant library of resources. So there's room for everyone. Um, I even come across strange stuff on Tubi. I'm like, where'd this come from, you know? But, but, it hasn't affected it. It just affects the fact that now there's more players in the game. So there's, there's more competition. So the key for any independent filmmaker who plans on making more than one movie is to sort of develop your own brand, like Roger Corman did with New World Pictures or, Char or Charles Band did with Empire and Full Moon. You know, once people recognize what you do, that's half the battle because it's so easy to just surf, click, 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 click. You know, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. I don't, you know, whatever. What? Oh yeah, I know who that guy is. I'll give this a shot. So I think over time we've created a brand without really knowing it, but I think it's helped us because our, our, our films are, they're all over the world. I mean, Japan, Germany, France, Africa, Mexico, you name it, um, they're out there. And, and I get emails from people all the time from different countries. I have to translate it because I don't understand you know, what it is initially. But Japan, we have a huge fan base in Japan. I can imagine, which kind of harkens all the way back to Godzilla. It's like yes. a full circle. <laughs> yes, it's like that was, and I told the guy, I'm like, you know, I told him the story and he, he thought that was hilarious. But yeah, you know, you know, you don't, as a filmmaker, you, you never, you look forward, you don't stop 
to see where you are and you don't look back too often because then you lose momentum. But eventually, you know, your your dream becomes a reality and then it becomes a profession and then it becomes a legacy. And I always joke with my children. I said, when I'm dead, someone's going to come to you and say, we want to make a $50 million movie about your dad. I said, good for you guys. Because in a million years, Ed Wood never would have thought someone would make a $40 million movie about him. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's funny, you think of independent filmmakers, and if you said, hey, who made Plan 9 from Outer Space? Most people would say, oh, that guy named Ed Wood. If you said, who directed Rollerball? Who won? You know, who's the winner? Ed Wood despite what he went through and what he thought about himself and what the world thought about him at the time. So you never know, you know, you just, you just keep doing what you're doing and eventually it becomes something. Well, I know as, you know, a creative person myself, it's, I find you very inspiring because I see like you use the same actors over and over and it's like this little community (laughs) that I just became so smitten with people like Jeff Kirkendall, you know, and Natalie and Titus. And (laughs) I got to interview Steve. I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Diaspora. Is that Diaspora? Yeah. Diaspora. Um, And, you know, they, you just fall in love with just seeing the same, and you're in them all the time, you know, so you just kind of fall in love with seeing the same people all the time. And it kind of makes you more, I know you feel like connected to it, you know, as you go through your catalog. So, um, and I, I've heard nothing, but, you know, I interviewed Ron Bonk too, who you've, you know, and um, they just, everybody just says such great things about you as a filmmaker and a person and just how nice you are, how organized you are, how focused you are and driven. And um, so it seems like all of these, this band, merry band of actors and, So do you make them work on the set too? Do you make them like, are they like holding the, what's the sound? Oh oh, yeah, we don't use that because we record direct, but everyone pitches in, you know, and and I try to be organized. Uh, You know, a a good director is, is a listener, a psychologist, a creative, a diplomat. There's all kinds of things that a director is on a set and, and the one thing you have to be is, is human. You've got to treat people with respect. I mean, it's filmmaking is fun, but it's hard work. And and I, you know, I I've been on film sets where things I would have not handled things the way they were handled. And it was I thought disgusting. It disc- you know it just upset me to see some of this stuff. But that's why people come back. It's a real family sort of. Uh, a, a feel, you know, we're not, we're getting together and having a good time, but we're, we're making a movie, you know, occasionally they have to say, Mark, can we eat lunch at some point? <laughs> You're like, nope, <laughs> nope, we're on a schedule. <laughs> yeah. You, you get, you know, you get into the, the zone and you've got your day planned and, and lunch and dinner are always in there. But sometimes I just forget, you know, we're setting up a shot and going through it. Okay. Let's do this. Let's do, oh, we, can we eat now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess we can <laughs> Well, it, it, I mean, it definitely looks like you guys are having a good time. I mean, it, I think that's, you know, people who are fans of, of your films definitely see that. And I think that's part of the draw. Um, and you also have, I know we have to, um, we have to cut it, cut it off pretty soon, but uh, you do have Jurassic Park, Jurassic Park, Jurassic Shark. I wish. I wish, right? <laughs> I know. I would have a more festive background yeah. behind me if I had, you know, that. There'd be um, palm trees behind me, <laughs> my cruise ship right. in the back, right? Right now it's a work in progress, but um, Jurassic Shark 3 Seavenge, mm-hmm. um, which also is already available on TV, but I think officially drops June 13. Um, and that was not, I mean, you're not the director of the original Jurassic Shark, no. it was Brett mm-hmm. Kelly, right? Brett Kelly directed the original, it was, I think, originally called Attack of the Jurassic Shark. It's released by a different distributor. It's been through a couple distributors, but it's a title that's done well, and it's a good movie. Brett, Brett's a good filmmaker. I enjoyed it, so it was kind of nice to take some of his ideas 
not rip it off by any means. They're different movies, but keep some thematic things with the, the crooks and whatnot and add your own spin to it. And it, it's obviously successful where they wouldn't keep asking us to make these, se- you know, you don't make a sequel to a movie that flops. Exactly. And, you know, this the second one, Aquapocalypse, which is yeah. one of my favorite things to say. <laughs> I can't hardly pronounce it. I just say the second one. The second one. Um, so that, yeah. So everybody watching right now, you can watch Cocaine Shark and Jurassic Shark 3 right now on 2B. Um, and then I guess the DVD will be officially out six, on June 13th for Jurassic Shark and then on July 11th for Cocaine yes. Shark. Yep. And it's funny, those movies are made like a year apart. And it's funny how, you know, here they are released one month apart. You think a movie gets made and it gets released right away. And, you know, people have a misconception about movies in general. They think it takes as long to make as it does to watch, which is far from the truth. Well, I mean, I know I've just learned a lot from talking to you today because I didn't, I mean, I don't know. I got my my own little thing, what I do with the writing and the even just trying to make a YouTube video, Mark, come on. This is like painful for me. I can't even imagine. <laughs> well, the more, you, the more you do it, the easier it gets. And it just comes, it's just experience. You know, anyone that's done anything as long as I have would be somewhat good at it, I would hope. Um, just takes time and and you find your style and, and, you know, it all comes together. And again, you know, Filmmaking, the movies that, that I've been involved with, they're only as good as what everyone brought to it. Sure, I might be the guy in charge who gets, you know, no credit and all the blame. That's typically how it goes. But everyone involved brought something to it that made it what it was. So I never want to undervalue the people that contribute to these films because th- their role is just as important as mine. Yeah, I, I think that's a lovely sentiment that you just said. Really, I mean, I'm so excited to finally meet you and be able to talk to you. And I, it's been I, a pleasure I, meeting you and talking to you. I got to do it yeah. again. I need more. <laughs> we can make that happen. Well, that's, well, that's awesome. Well, um, best of luck on the success of your two movies that are coming out. I'm sure you've got a ton more stuff in the There's- world. There's we'll talk least, about that at the next one. There's at least um, <laughs> seven more movies that I've made since then waiting to come out. So, so you're up to how many now total? Nine. I this uh, well, I'm I'm shooting a I'm I've been shooting a movie. I can't talk about it right now, but um, I, I've shot a couple. I'm up to ninety six, I think, wow. since nineteen eighty seven. It's a very low number. I Is need it? I need more. <laughs> I'm sure that I'm sure it'll get up there. You're going to be in the triple digits soon. <laughs> that would be kind of nice. But yeah, I don't like Jess Franco. They, they say he might have made 200 movies, but he's lost count. I mean, I lose count. People ask me stuff and I'm like, let me think. You know, that was in 1996. That was in 2003. I have to write it down or I totally lose track of what's what. Do some of your movies run together in your brain or can you, do you distinctly know like each yeah, movie? I can, I, I can separate it, but I can't always process when it was made. If I remember what movie was shot on either side, but even at my age, that's becoming harder and harder. So. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> okay. Well, I will let you go. Thank you again so much. It's Thank been- you. And uh, let's do this again. Let's yeah. seriously, let's do this again. Yeah, I'll send you a message and we'll figure something out. And, okay. Yeah, try to catch you between the movies. Like the two seconds between. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Maybe we'll just do it on set. That might be easy. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just come to set. You can just put me in one. <laughs> we can do that too. That would be so much fun. Oh my God, it's a dream. It's a dream. All right, well, um, have a wonderful rest of your day and I will talk to you soon. All right, take care. Bye, you too. Bye.